Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May 2nd. Today's topic is our featured teacher for the month of May. And our special guest is Lisa Parisi. Your show hosts or co-moderators are Peggy George, Lori Moffitt, that's me, and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. And I'm turning the mic over to Someone, Paula, I think maybe. <laughs> Peggy. No, Peggy, sorry. I knew it was to somebody to introduce Lisa for us. Thank you, Peggy. You're welcome. And welcome to all of you. We are so excited to have Lisa Parisian as our May featured teacher. We have all come to really love the featured teacher sessions because we get a chance to get a look inside the classroom and the lives of all of our special guests. I first met Lisa when she was doing regular podcasting in the EdTech Talk community, where she was a co-host of a couple of fantastic podcasts. She co-hosted Teachers Are Talking and It's Elementary, both wonderful shows, and she's moved on to many other things now. And I first started following Lisa back in 2007. So we're longtime friends, and I am so happy that she is with us today to share her classroom experiences and her professional experiences. Lisa is a fifth grade classroom teacher. She's dual certified in both general and special education. She teaches in, uh, in an elementary school on Long Island, that's in New York. And she has been helping students be successful for over 25 years. You probably are aware she has won many awards, including the SIGTEL Online Learning Award for Global Projects. She's had articles published in many magazines, Scholastic Magazine, Tech for Learning, and quite a few online sites. She has co-authored a fabulous book called Making Connections with Blogging that's about blogging in the classroom. If you haven't seen that, be sure to take a look at that. Lots of great advice and tips about blogging in your classroom. She's also a Discovery Educator Network Leadership Council member. She runs a weekly Twitter chat about the DEN, and she even runs webinars for BrainPop and CAST, sharing her knowledge of UDL and Global Connections. She's a smart exemplary educator, a Glogster ambassador, and a Vokey ambassador. Oh yes, and a Fable Vision ambassador. So all of these extra things help her keep up with technology in the classroom. And most recently, this is very exciting, Lisa was recognized as one of the top 50 finalists for the Global Teacher Prize for her achievements both in the classroom and beyond the classroom as a model of excellence. So I'm going to move on to the newbie question and ask Lisa if she would answer this question for us and then move right into her presentation. We always like to ask our featured teachers, what does Web 2.0 mean to you? And <clears throat> why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So Lisa, click on talk and take it away. Well, thank you, Peggy, for the introduction. It makes me sound a lot more important than I am. Um, I, um, I actually am going to go a little bit backwards before I answer this question and just let you know that, um, yes, Peggy, we've known each other since 2007. And 2007 is when I first discovered Web 2.0 tools and really what they were, and one of the first um, sites I joined was Classroom 2.0 um, and found a lot of people and I got Skype and I started a blog that year and I started a blog with my students that year and I got into Twitter and followed the, all the 50 teachers that were online at the time and we all followed each other. Um, what Web 2.0 means to me is that I can finally have my students be part of the change that I need them to, to be, to take, to make this world a better place. 
um, it allows me to bring the world to them. It allows me to bring them to the world. It allows me to show them what's out beyond the four walls of the classroom. And it is it allows me to connect with people I never ever would have been able to connect with before to discover what people are doing out there, to try it out myself, to get support when I need it, to um, see what other people are showcasing. I think that I couldn't, I couldn't go backwards anymore. I just couldn't. And um, I, you know, as for a newbie, I'm not sure that's th that's the best answer, but it is. That is for me what Web 2.0 is. So I uh, okay. So there's a connect page if anyone's interested in connecting with me. And I'm not really sure what pages are on here. If you okay, good. Okay, that's what I want to know. Um, so anyone who wants to connect with me, go right ahead. And I do sort of want to take it from how I got to where I am and what I do in the classroom right now. So the very first, you should know that in March of 2007, I went to a New York City conference. Um, it was a teaching conference, celebration of teachers and learners. They're, they're finally starting up again. Um, I loved the conference. It was the first time I had gone. And I went into a small classroom at the time um, to listen to a man I had never heard of before, Alan November. And for those of you who don't know Alan November, you should really look him up. And he was presenting. And I love this man, and I owe him everything, because without him, I would not be online. I walked into his session, and he said what I say all the time now, which is, there is no excuse for you not to be online anymore. There is absolutely no excuse for you not to have your children doing this. He did it a little scary. Um, he actually berated all of us if we weren't doing all of these things. And a lot of people left offended. Me, I wrote down every single thing he said. He said, if you're not doing Skype, you shouldn't be teaching anymore. If you're not doing, this is what he does, Peggy. If you're not doing, um, if you're not on Twitter, you shouldn't be teaching anymore. If your kids aren't blogging, you shouldn't be teaching anymore. If you're not on Wikipedia and editing, you shouldn't be teaching anymore. And a lot of teachers walked out of there very unhappy. I walked out of there with a list of things I needed to find out about. And I went home. That It was on a Friday. I went home, looked into everything, and I set up my very first blog. This is my blog. Um, and, and I've been doing it ever since. I'm not as frequent a blogger as I'd like to be, but um, I do have my students' blog. I'm going to share the screen at the time. <clears throat> so I'll give you all a second to catch up with me. And oops. That's not what I wanted open. That's what I wanted open. So I'm assuming everyone can now see my screen. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, we can, Lisa, okay, but can yeah. you make sure your browser's on top so that big black box isn't covering? There you go. Like that? Perfect. I'm just, I just want, oops. Okay, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I just want to see the uh, chat room, too, in case anyone is saying anything, but you'll let me know then. If anyone has we'll let you know, yeah. Don't worry about okay. the chat, because it always brings up those boxes. Okay. <laughs> so there you are, Peggy, right on my... Well, on my okay, that's what I wanted to go to. So I I did join Twitter, and this is my Twitter page right now. And there are so many people right now who say they will not go on Twitter. It's too confusing. They can't figure it out. And I do have to admit that when I joined Twitter, it was a lot easier. That there really were only 50 teachers on, and. We all followed each other. We all had exactly the same followers. We would have one conversation going. And at the end of every night, I would say good night to everybody in Twitter so that in the morning when I woke up, I could go online, scroll back to where I said good night, 
and see everything that was going on while I was sleeping. I can't do that anymore. As you see, I have a lot more than um, 50 followers, and I'm following a lot more than 50 people. But what that has done for me is expanded my horizons beyond what I ever thought would be possible, well beyond what I ever thought would be possible. So Twitter is my my friend. <laughs> it's what I it's what I love. It's what I go to. Now I had oh there it is. Um, this is my my blog live. It's the first um, thing I ever really set up as a um, as a teacher. In fact, I set this blog up I think before I went. Yep, 2007 was my very first year in my blog, and um, I was very prolific that year because it was all so new to me. But it is funny taking a look at early blogs and seeing what's going on. Um, so I'm back in the classroom, and I, I started off by introducing every new tool that I would come across. I'd bring it into the classroom and say to the students, I have no idea what this does, but let's play with it. Um, and you should know also that I am a responsive classroom teacher. And what that means is that um, it's an approach to teaching that allows the students to be more responsible and more compassionate and more cooperative in their work. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is because when, and Peggy, please feel free to jump in and talk to me because I hate lecturing. Um, but it means that I can trust my students to be online because I have taught them from day one very clearly that they need to treat people a certain way, and that includes online people. So I, I just wanted to mention Responsive Classroom for that, because it is something that, um, that really sets the tone in my, class, in my classroom. OK, I'm going to, there was one more site I wanted to get up. So in 2007, yeah, OK. That's not good. We'll just go to Wikispaces and I'll find it from there. Um, in 2007, that very, very first year when I didn't know what I was doing, I also signed up, as Peggy mentioned earlier, for um, ed for EdTech Talk. I had no idea what it was. And I signed up for the Webcast Academy. I didn't know what webcasting was, and I learned to webcast. One of the people that I met there was a teacher who lives in Australia. And the reason that I'm telling you that is because this was the very, very first project I ever did globally. Um, I was teaching my students through a textbook just like I always did. We were learning about the Southern Hemisphere through a textbook. I had still not gotten it in my head because it was so new to me that we could learn about the Southern Hemisphere by speaking to people in the Southern Hemisphere. But um, I did, I'm, I'm pulling up the chat because I want to see if anyone's saying anything. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, so, and, and uh, Patty, Nobody else in my school does this. Nobody else. Um, they're starting to do little things, and I will talk about that. But right now, this is just me. So that very first year, I'm in the classroom teaching my kids about the Southern Hemisphere. And one of the kids says, I heard it's true that the toilet water turns in the opposite direction in the Southern Hemisphere. Is that true or not? And I said, I have no idea, but let's find out. And so what I did is I called the only person I knew in the Southern Hemisphere, and it happened to be Chrissy Hellier from EdTech Talk. And she was on Skype. And I don't know why she was on in the middle of the day, but she was, because it was the middle of the night for her. But she was on. And 
she and I said to her, hi, my students want to know if, it, if the toilet water spins in the opposite direction. What she did is she videotaped the toilet water spinning and sent it to us. And then she connected me with a teacher because she wasn't a classroom teacher. She connected me with a classroom teacher in New Zealand that was so perfect a connection for us that if we had dug right through our classroom, we would have ended up right in her classroom. They were literally on the opposite side of the world from us. And we did all kinds of things. We did seasons and shadows and gravity and sunrise and sunset and compasses and whirlpools, which was the ultimate toilet water um, question. And my students did all kinds of research about seasons and about shadows. We, we went out and we did a I can show you these pictures here. We did a sundial. I had them go outside every hour of the day to take a picture so that we could see the human sundial. We got information back from Alana's class. And just to show you what was exciting about it, this was us at the time. It was December and very, very cold. And this was Alana. And that was her class at the time on the beach. And we were so jealous as we were sitting outside freezing that that's what they were doing on the beach. So that started, this actually won an award for us, and it started everything. I quickly switched, though, from tools to play with back to curriculum because I need to do curriculum. And so my projects now are very curriculum based. This was another one that I won an award for, Natural Disasters in Us. I did this with um, Donna Roman, who is in Illinois. Our students researched. I, had, I was supposed to teach geography. That was my curriculum, teaching geography. So I decided to do it through natural disasters. So they, they found out what kind of geography is needed for drought and for um, earthquakes and floods and hurricanes and so on. And while we were there, while we were doing this whole project, Hurricane Sandy hit New York. And we were out of school for 10 days. And um, I think I have a participant's pictures here, but I'm not sure. Um, and they were so worried about us. Yeah, there we are. They were so worried about us that they set up a collection to send us money because they thought we had lost everything. When I told them we hadn't, they decided they were going to send it to um, the Red Cross and help out in that way. But it was just real um, serendipitous that we were learning about natural disasters and then we had a natural disaster. But as you can see, this also has resources that I give my students that are appropriate for them. It has rubrics because everything we do is scored. So we score it through rubrics, group, group work, and regular work, so how they work together and the work that we were asking them to do. So I went from very simply calling somebody on Skype and saying, which way does the toilet water spin, to being able to collaborate projects this, pro this natural disasters project took us about 10 weeks. It wasn't supposed to, but we had Sandy in the middle of it. So it took us about 10 weeks. And, um, and that was why, and that was, that's a lot. I'm going to stop sharing for a little bit now. But th that was a lot of time to just um, be with another class every single day working on projects and using Google Docs and using Skype or Google Hangouts if Skype wasn't working so well, just so that we can connect every single day with our partners. It took a lot to get there um, from flushing the toilet <laughs> in uh, New Zealand. But it's, it is something at this point I could never go back on. And the things that I do now with my students, while they're all curriculum related, they're also all responsive classroom related. We care so much about the world that we help people out. In fact, this week coming up, my students are having a, my school is having a penny war to raise money for the earthquakes um, survivors in Nepal. 
And the week after that, we're having a bake sale to raise money for our friends in um, in the Kibara slums in um, Africa. And that was something we had been working on for quite a while. This is what we do in the classroom. This is what it means to be global. And I couldn't do it without those thousands of people that I connect with on Twitter and on Facebook and in Skype. Um, and in, in Google Plus, and it's it's not something I can go back and say I can't I don't do this anymore. Now I would love questions. I feel like I'm talking, talking, talking. So Peggy, you want me to describe a responsive classroom? So responsive classroom um, is something where I every year start at the beginning of the year by teaching children very, very specifically the rules of the classroom. And we start with CARES, C-A-R-E-S, CARES. CARES stands for Cooperation, Assertion, Responsibility, Empathy, and Self-Control. And every single thing we do, we are a class that cares, everything. So. So when we go, when we, like self-control, I always teach my children, self-control really has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with empathy. Because when you're home by yourself and no one's around, you can be as crazy, loud, annoying as you want to be. But when other people are around, now you have to have self-control because you have to have empathy for the people that are learning around you. So we have meetings and we, we talk about everything and it's part of everything we do. So the way that, it's, that it works with global experiences is that my children immediately want to help out when they see something going on in the world, like the earthquake, like our friends um, in um, the Kibera slums in Nairobi. They want to help out. When we did the, the um, Traveling Rhinos project, I was doing it I was, the Traveling Rhinos Project is a global project that won an award last year, and um, Karen Statler is a woman who sends these rhinos out. It's sort of like a flat Stanley project, except that it's to let people know what's happening with rhinos, that they are becoming extinct. And um, I was doing it simply because I thought it was cute and we could write letters and I had to, that was my curriculum, I had to teach my students letters and I had to teach them um, how to do different kinds of writing. We got into argumentative writing because they wanted to save the rhinos. They wanted to do more than just host this stuffed animal and get pictures of him and pass him around. They held a bake sale um, and raised $1,500 for the rhino um, problems that Karen showed us a site to share with. They um, wrote argumentative letters to all of the um, government officials we could come up with to get them to help save rhinos. And these were things that would never have happened without Responsive Classroom. I would have shown them this and we would have had a cute little Flat Stanley project. There wouldn't have been more, but I'm teaching them to be empathetic and I'm teaching them to think about what's going on in the world. Um, and, and Paula, Common Core Standards, you're so right that you can cover it because Common Core Standards say that our children need to learn to communicate with people in different countries, with different dialects, with different languages. We need to do it on, they need to learn how to do it online. They need to do it in person. That's all Common Core and that's all global learning is. That's what it is. It's, it's taking something that you're doing in your classroom and opening it up so that your students can be part of some, something bigger. Um, I see Louise is here and she's joined our videos a couple of times. Um, we do, um, we, I do videos every year um, and I'm thinking of another one for next year for peace.org. Um, the peacedayorg um, site is asking us to um, 
to do another peace video, and I get classes from all over the world participating. And I truly believe that it's very hard to go to war with your friend. It's much easier to go to war with your enemy. But if I get my kids online and I get them to meet children from other worlds, then it's not their enemy anymore. It's their friend. And, um, and they're just, there are so many amazing things that come out of that. When we were doing our very first um, video, if I can um, put the link in the chat, I will put the link in the chat for it. Um, when we were doing our very first video, which was the happy dance, um, I think I have it. Oh no, it's right here. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can play a video on the... It would be better just to give us the link and we can go to it in our browser. It won't okay. play an app so sharing. I'm just gonna, okay, so I'm just going to share the site so you can see it, but it is in um, Our Global Friendships. But that was not the page I had up. Okay, I guess the sharing didn't work. Let me try that again. Um, application sharing. Resume sharing. Okay, there we go. So this is our global friendships. It is, um, I have a global friendship group that I meet with um, once a month on Sundays on Skype, and they come from all over the world. There are about 12 of us in the group from as far reaching as Taiwan and Malaysia to a bunch of places in the United States and Canada and we have Mexico and we have just so many places all over the place, a whole bunch of places in Europe. And we put this website together because we were coming up with so many project ideas and we wanted to get people to join in. So please come to this website anytime and see what's going on. But this video that's right on the front is a video that we did last year. And um, I know Louise is in there. She's part of it. There was a class from the Ukraine who was part of this video. It was just very simply dancing to the song Happy by um, Pharrell Williams. And the kids just had a lot of fun with it. Not very curriculum oriented. Not really what we tend to think about. But during the video, during the recordings, I was waiting for everyone to send me a recording, and um, Russia went into Crimea and attacked Crimea, which is right under the Ukraine. And when they did, right away, my students wanted to know how close they were to the class that was working with us in the Ukraine, and were they OK? So we went online, and I emailed the teacher and said, is everyone OK? What's going on? And she said, we're fine, because there's no war in the Ukraine. So it's only in Crimea, and we're safe. And then about two days later, I get an email from her that they're not going to be able to participate, because school has been closed, because there's war in Crimea. And the war in Crimea had moved into the Ukraine. So I said, what if we gave you an extension? We really would love to have you participate, not really thinking much about um, what that meant for her. OK, if I hit stop, stop. OK, I'll figure this out. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I, um, Yes, Paul, I am part of Hello Little World Skyper. So I gave her an extension. And what she sent back to me was, were these teenage girls standing out in front of their school doing a choreographed dance to Happy? It wasn't just like the rest of us were doing, where we were bouncing around and jumping and dancing. They choreographed it. They put it together. It was beautiful. And all I could think was, the looks on their faces, how happy they were doing this dance, was exactly what those children needed at the time when their country was at war. They needed a little break, and they needed to know they were part of something bigger, and that people care. OK, keep my browser. I don't know what you mean. I, I'm trying not to share this anymore. 
That's what I'm trying to do, to not share. Cancel. So it's, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Peggy. <laughs> but feel free to do whatever you need me to do. I want to to stop sharing. Do you want to just go back to slides? Yes. All righty. There you go. There we go. OK. So um, even though that wasn't curriculum related, it was just something fun we were doing, my kids learned about geography. We learned where everybody was. They became a part of another class, and they we, we were sharing emails back and forth with what was going on in their world at the time. These are, this is what global is all about, and this is what it means to go global. There are wonderful small little projects you can do mystery Skype calls. And Paula, why don't you jump in and share the story you want to share um, about our mystery Skype call? Uh, OK, I was going to save it till the end, but I was That's I okay. that now. Um, Lisa and I have been connected for quite a few years, and one year my students and I were doing um, presentations uh, about Mardi Gras to other classrooms. Um, I had put together a Google Doc and tweeted it out and said, hey, if you want us to come into your classroom and teach you about Mardi Gras, we can set up a time to do that. So Lisa signed up for her um, fifth graders to listen to my fourth graders do our um, Mardi Gras presentation. And I had divided my kids into groups. And each group had to um, research and then speak about a certain aspect of Mardi Gras. <laughs> when we got to the king cake part, Lisa was sitting toward the back of her class. But you know, she had her whole classroom on screen. But she was sitting there listening. And the kids were in the front. And all of a sudden, my students are talking about how there is a baby hidden in the king cake, <laughs> and the person who gets and just leaves the attention of the diverted for a couple of seconds because she heard baby in the cake, and she stood <laughs> up and she went, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a what in the cake? <laughs> and it was so cute because you know the kids, I guess, had kind of like gone right over their heads, but she wanted to know more and more about what the baby and the cake was. So luckily, we actually had um, a sample to show them. And it was so much fun to see Lisa's look of relief when she realized we were talking about a little plastic baby doll that is hidden within the cake after it's baked. And the tradition is, of course, when the person who gets the piece with the baby in it has to do the next cake party. But if you had seen the face, it was just so hysterical. And those are things that just, you know, make these kind of connections so much fun and so rewarding. Yes, it was academically based. You know, my kids had done the research, they'd done the work, her kids were learning and asking us questions, and it was absolutely a wonderful experience. And that is a perfect little story of what happens when you open up your doors. And we, we do mystery Skypes at the beginning of the year when I'm teaching my children geography because it's amazing how little they know about geography. Um, and so those of you who don't know, a mystery Skype is very simply a 20 questions game where you're trying to find out the location of the people you're calling. So the teachers know the location, but the students don't. And they run the whole thing. Um, and, I, and my students learn geography that way. So I actually start with telling them we're in the United States, and then we spread out to the rest of the world. Um, and one year, we um, Skyped with a class in Texas. And the teacher wouldn't, didn't talk at all during the mystery Skype call. When we get to the end of it, we always go on to Google, Drive, um, Google Earth, and we sit down with the class that we just were, were Skyping with when we find out where we are. And we look up their class in Google Earth, and they look up ours. And that's when the teachers usually start to speak. And my students, we were Skyping with Texas. They found out it was in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas. They found out we were in New York. And then the teacher started talking. And when the teacher started talking, he had this thick, heavy, heavy Texas accent. And he said he wasn't going to say anything ahead of time because 
the kids would have guessed right away where he was from. And my class started laughing and then looked at all of their students, because now we're looking at a large screen, everyone there. And they said they were really surprised because they thought everyone in Texas sounded like that and they thought everyone in Texas wore cowboy hats and cowboy boots. And those fifth graders that we were Skyping with said to us, well, they're surprised because they thought everybody in New York were gangsters. And it was just very funny getting them to see, no, you know, we're just kids. We're all just kids and we're all just people and we sound a little different from each other, but that's what they see on TV and that's what they're concerned about. Um, and I think it's just really, you know, not being afraid to get out there, to try it out. I have had mystery Skypes that have totally failed. The, I remember doing one with a class in Costa Rica and I was so excited because we were getting out of the United States into Costa Rica and um, the teacher, <laughs> I thought her students were going to kill her. She comes online and she says, welcome to the mystery Skype, welcome to Costa Rica. And my kids all went, what? Like she introduced herself by saying where she is. Her students wanted to just kill her for that. They were like, are you kidding? You just told them where we were. And we were just laughing and my kids were like, we just, it's blown. I was like, well, we can still give them clues and they can guess where we are. But those are things that go on. And um, connection fails. Well, I have to tell you what happened on um, Thursday. We had We've been doing this global book talk that I run on my Our Global Friendships and we just finished the book Beholding Bee by um, Kimberly Newton Fusco. And I posted it on Twitter and she saw that, that we were doing, that we were reading the book and she tweeted me and said, I would love to help out. Any way I can, let me know. So we had a Skype call with her and we set it up on Thursday. I come in Thursday morning. It's Thursday afternoon. There are going to be four classes involved and her. So I know I have to update Skype. I come in to update and my computer is not working. The monitor is dead. I don't know what's going on. I grab the computer teacher who, thank goodness, was able to get it going and I said, now you need to update Skype. So we did all that. I get the kids all back. We all set up, make sure we can see each other on camera. I have everyone in the call. I'm, already, I'm ready to push, start the call, and the fire, drill go, fire bell goes off. We're having a fire drill. This is right at the beginning. So I sent in the chat, we're having a fire drill. Be right back. My kids all go outside. I go outside. I knew that it was a drill because as soon as I got out there, I asked the person in charge, is this just a drill? She said, yes. As soon as it was over, my students went running back in, which we're never supposed to do during a fire drill. But we had to get back to the classroom as quickly as possible. We went running back in. We all sat down. We're panting. And I, as I start the um, call, you know, it just, it just happens. We've had mystery Skype calls where the pledge comes on in the middle and I have to mute the mic so they don't hear us pledging to the United States of America. Um, things happen and one of the nice things about having a lot of ways to connect is if one way doesn't work, you try something else. I have had um, calls like when I was working with Donna Roman on, a, on that long project, there were times when I was on and I thought she was supposed to be on and she wasn't and I would call her phone, actually call her. And she would say to me, oh, we're coming on. We were having problems getting the computers up or, you know, or oops, I thought we were doing it later in the afternoon. And I would say, oh, you're right. We have changed the time. These things happen. And, you know, teachers know how to be flexible and, and we do it. And it's fun. And I think that that, here's the Global Classroom Project, which I love. Louise should recognize that. Louise, I put it up because, because he said we're going to keep it going. So that's why it's there. I was, I was hesitating, but it's a great place to find people to connect with, as is Twitter, as is Skype in the classroom, Skype for educators. Um, 
Oh, sure. Let me go back to that page. So this is, um, all right, I'll share. <laughs> um, I'll share my desktop again. And I will go to, let's see, another one. This is my resume online. That's what this is all about. And I'm updating it as much as I can. But these are a bunch of collaborations that I've taken part in. Um, our global friendships I talked about, we run um, quad blogging. And we run global book talks in Edmodo. And we just post, like whenever I'm doing a video, I post online that we're looking for participants. Western Hemisphere is a project that I do that's curriculum based. It's our social studies curriculum, but I do it with other classes. And we learn about um, economy and government and geography, all different things in the Western Hemisphere. I showed natural disasters in us. Energizing Energy was another project I won an award for. I worked with Brian Crosby in Nevada when he was still teaching in a classroom. Our kids worked together to learn about energy. We covered our entire science unit in there, um, our entire year of science in this Energizing Energies site, the children um, researched different energy and they created experiments. They wrote experiments that the other, cla the other class had to do. And then they performed experiments online to prove what they were learning. It was an amazing um, learning experience. And it was all done online. Civil War Project is a project that my students work on. Um, I give them resource sites, and they learn about the Civil War and then teach other people. Sign of the Beaver, this is really simple. This is a really simple project you can do. And if you send it out to the world, people can join in. It's, I'm sorry, I have to mute for a second. Peggy, could you talk? Allie, what's going on? Sure, I can talk. Um, it sounds like Lisa has company. Um, I'm really happy to hear her talking about some of these different projects that she's done, because all of them will give us ideas about the ways that we can uh, get a global project started. So I hope that you'll uh, all am, uh, drop sorry, your questions into Peggy. the chat as uh, Lisa is talking, if you'd like to know more about any of these projects. And welcome back, Lisa. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, I had to find out what was going on. Spiders. Um, so anyway, the reason I'm showing this is because this is a book that I read in my class. And so I took it here, and the kids do projects based on the book, on vocabulary or life in 1768. It's a very, very simple thing to do. And we connect with all kinds of people to do these kinds of projects. Um, quad blogging is where we take their, their groups of four classes put together. And I've, I've done this with um, about probably about 24 classes at the most. Um, I put everyone into groups of four from places in, around the world. And um, each week, one class posts a blog, usually about their school or about where they live. And the other classes all comment to those blogs so that every child gets a comment. And then at the very end, when we've done all four together, um, at the very end, um, they all write a reflection blog and, and link back to the, the blog that they're reflecting from. So one blog that, that really moved them, and they reflect on it. Um, time zone experiences actually came right out of ISTE. Um, when I was talking to someone at ISTE, and we were talking about projects we should do together, but we couldn't figure out the time zone. So we figured we'd do a project on time zones. And we did, and it won an award. Poetry collaboration. I have to do a poetry unit every year. So I do it with Love That Dog by Sharon Creech, who now follows me on Twitter because I've posted this. See, it's very cool. Um, and they follow the book. And people come in and post poems on the, on the project. 
Classroom Book Talk is a site where kids put, um, they put, children from all over the place put their um, reviews, book reviews on the Classroom Book Talk and it's been going on for years. Um, and that's, the other things are things that I've taught. That's about, um, you can see I'm involved with a lot of wikis and that's really all about what we're doing. And um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to hear them. Why do I use wikis? Good question, Peggy. I use wikis because even though I am a Google certified teacher, I don't like Google Sites. I don't find it um, as user friendly. I know friends of mine who use Weebly now. I don't find I have I, I'm I'm part of a Weebly project called Distance Learning that Michael Soskill started, a distance teaching project. Sorry, where kids go and put videos up. I can't. I've screwed up that site every time I've gone to edit. Um, to me, wikis is just the easiest, and anyone can join in, and it can be moderated. The whole thing can be moderated. So I like using wikis. Um, because it's very, very user friendly. Plus, Wiki Spaces gives us free wikis. If you're an educator and you create a site for education, no advertisements show up on it. <coughs> um, so my book is Making Connections with Blogging, um, Authentic Learning for today's classrooms and um, this is actually a book that I wrote with Brian Crosby who I had never met before we won that award, before we won a writing award at ISTE. We did a, we did a Harris Burdick project, his class and my class. We met through blogging. Um, our kids were both blogging on a site and, um, and that's how we met. Like we just talked to each other about the blogging and so we ended up writing this whole book on Google Docs. Only once did we get together in person to do any of the writing, and that's because we happened to be at a conference together, and um, and it was posted. I mean, it was it was published by ISTE, and I moved to Google Docs from Wikispaces for group work. Um, and Patty, absolutely, my students do all their work in Google Docs. So even the wikis that I have, the work that's being done is, is in Google Docs. The projects are done anywhere. The projects can be a video, they can be um, a voice thread, they can be whatever it is. But the wiki is the presentation page and it's the rubrics page and it's the um, essential questions page and the resources page. So whatever's going on, happens on the wiki, but the work itself is being done in Google Docs. Um, yes, Louise, a nice place for curation. And so next week I am presenting at, um, at the Learning and the Brain um, Educating World Class Minds in Learning and the Brain Conference in New York City at the Sheridan Hotel. This is a conference put on by um, Harvard University and Columbia University and they asked Donna to come and present something about a program that she's part of and she couldn't do both, conf both presentations so she asked me to do one on globalization and she's doing one on um, a project, Lesson for All project. Um, there are so many things that I've been able to do like go to Guatemala. I went to Guatemala because one of my um, friends in our global friendship group, her husband works for a company or runs a company in Guatemala that was bringing education there and they were having a Google conference and I was the keynote for it. I would never have had that opportunity if it weren't for going global and being online and connecting with people because that's how I find out what's going on in the world and that's how my kids find out what's going on in the world. Any other questions? Peggy, you want to jump in?
Okay. <laughs> this was something else I found out with from Tony. Um, <laughs> from to one another one of my friends in the global in our global friendships, and she said, "Yeah, Tony Barton." She said, "Does anyone know about this global teacher prize?" And I was like, "No, what is it?" And she put it out, and she said, "But it's due next week. Is anyone going to do it? Anyone going to do it?" Yeah, Tony Oliveri. Could I don't know. My mind went blank there, Louise. Um, and so I said, "Oh, why not? I'll I'll do it." And I put it this together and ended up be, being one of the 50 finalists. Um, they chose 10. I wasn't one of the 10 that were chosen to go to um, Dubai. And the winner won a million dollars. It wasn't me, but I tried and met a lot of people through it. All right, Peggy, come on in now. Lisa, there were a few questions that I captured that you already answered. So unless somebody has other questions, anyone have any other questions for Lisa? Or would like to share their experiences with some of the collaborate, collaborative projects like Paula did? OK, Paula has her hand up. Go ahead, Paula. I just wanted to, on a personal note, um, tell Lisa and her wonderfully talented daughter that one of my prized possessions is what I call my geek <laughs> seat that her daughter made for me. Um, I believe when she was a senior in high school, if I'm uh, remembering that correctly, Lisa. I think and so. Every time I wear them to school or to IFTE or wherever <laughs> where my geek seats, I always get lots of comments because what her daughter did was she took um, information from me and she took a pair of like, like white kids and she put all of the websites on the kids uh, that I was using at that time and they are, I mean I'm so careful with them because you know I don't want to get them dirty and I want them to stay in nice shape but I love Every time I put them on my feet, they just make me feel happy. And I am so grateful that I don't remember how I learned about that from Lisa, but it was so much fun to, to you know, I waited for a little while to get my sneakers, and then when they came in, I was like, oh, these are so cool. And like I said, every time I wear them, my kids are like, those are neat. And it's something that I keep saying, gee, I need to have my kids do this one time as a project in the classroom. I think that would be Oh, that fantastic. would be cute, right? That would be a cute idea. Um, yeah, my daughter made a, a pair for herself and then made a pair for me, um, and I posted them on Facebook. And that's when you and Nancy, came, um, Sharon, came in and said they wanted. So she did it. Um, somebody, let's see, Louise wanted to know what I'm doing at ISTE this year. Well, the the, um, I'm doing a lot. There's a poster session for the Global Classroom Project, I think. And I'm doing two presentations, one on um, global learning and one on making connections with Web 2.0 tools. And I put in for an Ignite session. We'll, I don't know if that's coming out yet. No awards. None at all. But, you know, I do what I can do. And I guess that's about it. So thank you all for coming and listening and participating. Thanks so much, Lisa, for the wonderful ideas for those of us that aren't quite global yet. I think I'm turning the mic over to Peggy for the upcoming show slide. Yes, thank you so much, Lisa. We are always so inspired by all of the great things you are doing, especially with global collaboration, but with so many things. So thanks for sharing that with us. We hope all of you will plan to join us in our upcoming shows. Next week, we're going to have Chris Giles, who is going to be doing some great things with Google Chrome extensions for the classroom. So try to log 
log in on your computers on that and have Google Chrome installed if you want to work along with him. He's going to actually do some hands-on things in that session. And then on May 16th, we're so excited to have Sydney Sharon with us. She actually joined us in our, our session today. And she has an amazing presentation ready for us about how to help your students learn using movies. And I know you're going to want to hear that. We won't have a show on May 23rd because that's Memorial Day weekend in the United States. And then on May 30th, we have the fabulous Latia Cooper, you may know her as Tech Latia, coming to share her fabulous live binder with us with a whole new tab in it for connecting, creating, and collaborating with science websites web tools and apps. So that will be a great session. So I hope all of, us, all of you will come back and join us. And thank you so much for joining us today. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest endeavor. He's gathered all of his professional learning resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series. And if you do sign up for uh, hosting your own webinar, you've got to make the session public, uh, then the session's free for you. And you host your presentation in a collaborate uh, classroom. You can nominate a featured teacher. There's a form in the Live Binder to do that, as well as this URL, uh, like Lisa is. She was the feature teacher this month for May. As you exit the session, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open in your browser. If it doesn't, you can take the link that Peggy has just placed in the chat. Uh, there's also a tab in the resources section of each live binder for the, or the survey as well. At the end of the survey, there's a pair of fields for you to request a professional development certificate. One is for your name, which gets printed on their certificate now. The other is for an email address. Uh, please use a personal email address for that rather than a school email address because uh, school email servers tend to block the certificates from reaching you for reaching you. The resources for uh, archived video collections and audio collections are, are on iTunes U, as well as available from the Weebly site. There's an RSS feed button that you can get the archives as a, uh, in a feed reader, as well as, of course, getting to the archives on the Classroom 2.0 Live uh, website. So spe special thanks to uh, Lisa Parisi, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thanks so much for coming.